again sitting here at the cable easel with a program of painting from life uh, the only thing is that when I paint landscapes we don't go out with a crew we go out with a crew and shoot a videotape and then it's projected here on this monitor and that's about the closest that we ever get to going out of doors we may change that someday we may all go out with a picnic basket and a couple of cameras and do it but uh, for the most part this is an innovation that began here at this program of the cable easel whereby the monitor and the tape is what I work from it seems to work rather well and um, you certainly don't have to swat the flies and the mosquitoes by doing this. So, this is a scene of one of the canals in the South Shore's uh, town of Bayshore. Uh, there are many, many canals, many beautiful houses, and uh, who can resist a house on a canal? So, uh, what I'm going to go, the only thing I'm going to do about this scene that you see here, I'm going to cut out the entire grassy area in the foreground. I'm going to let that simply be water. Uh, I think that compositionally it'll be more interesting, and uh, that's the uh, thing that we're allowed to do as painters. We're allowed to take out what we want to take out. All right, I'm starting with a perfectly blank canvas, and uh, the uh, shtick here is that you lay it out. It's called composition. Other programs decide that you can go right ahead and start putting paint all over canvas. It doesn't matter where you start, but I believe in a plan. Uh, something as simple as uh, scrambling an egg needs a plan, and so uh, when you're going to do a painting, it also needs a plan. It's not as simple as scrambling an egg, but it can be if you find out how to do it and if you uh, are devoted to the idea of working from life. Now, this is obviously a horizon line. Uh, there's something going to take place above it and something going to take place below it. But you have to start somewhere. This is where you start, the horizon line. All right, uh, the horizon line then tells me that over here there is a general lawn and grassy area on which those houses are resting, so that gets put in as well. This is a two-line composition so far. Now, uh, in order to be able to um, determine the scale of the houses, put the trees in first. So the tree is going to occupy approximately this much space. And the, from then on, the size of the houses is determined by its relationship to the trees. I talk about relationships and points of reference. This is what I mean. So, this house is not any taller than the tree. And if you, if you remember this kind of a, of, a, of a piece of information, you're not going to start out by doing an enormous house and then find yourself going way out of the, out of the uh, picture because you haven't had the, uh, the, the proportion correct. Uh, I'm not going to make this a house and gardens uh, architectural drawing of this particular uh, um, house, but I'm going to show you the general idea of how you have to think about how you're going to do this. Um, uh, especially if you want to do a painting of your own house. And it's possible spending uh, close to 30 years of your life to pay for this thing, you just may want to do a painting of it. Nice idea. I get commissioned to do paintings of houses all the time. Um, because people have a sense of where they are, where they live, and what they own. And so, this is a nice way to do it. You can only gain from this particular experience. You'll gain and see what, uh, what about your house you like, possibly what has to be done to fix it, and possibly uh, whether or not you want to stay there for the rest of your days or you want to have a painting of it because you're going to move and you'd like to take a general visual remembrance of the place. So this didn't really start out as the idea of doing portraits of houses, but it isn't a bad one. 
And it isn't certainly going to be uh, anything lost because you're learning something about proportion and you're learning something about uh, how, to, uh, how to relate uh, the house with the landscape in which it sits. So I'm now, as I'm talking to you endlessly like a great magpie, I'm, I'm drawing this house and um, showing you how you go about uh, a general um, layout of the, how much do you want to include? Do you want to include all of this house? Do you want to include only some of it? And how big is it going to be? So. Of course, there are houses on Long Island that are so beautiful and so huge and so expensive that doing paintings of the house, of those particular things is a project, quite an extraordinary project in themselves, especially the people who may or may not be tuning in on this. In the Hamptons, uh, that, is a, that is a deal in itself, uh, especially along Dune Road, which I believe um, probably suffered a great deal about uh, in one of the high winds that we had this uh, summer, and maybe um, maybe if somebody had done a painting of the house before that took place, there would be a, a, a nice visual re remembrance of it. Not that you have to have a visual remembrance of everything, but we tend to like uh, to have places on our uh, pictures on our walls that we recognize as places that we know. And what better thing than one's own house? I don't know who belongs to this house. Uh, I'm hoping that whoever belongs to this house uh, sees the program and then flips and wants to um, acquire it which is just another polite way of saying buy. Uh, if it's of any success at all, I would consider selling it to them. If it's of no success, I will put it in the drawer uh, under F for failure, because many times I do fail, and um, the only way that you learn and how to overcome failure is to just keep doing it. Uh, here is the, um, here is the, what you call a slip um, in nautical language, and down there in Bayshore, slips are uh, parts of the house. Uh, you go down the lawn and you moor your boat. Um, I have never been of that particular uh, um, class of society that has enough money to do that and I'm not sure that I ever want to be bothered with a boat. A boat to me looks like it might be an enormous amount of work and a tremendous amount of worry but um, so be it. Uh, there are that's why I would rather paint than go on a boat so uh, but uh, there are people who have these wonderful boats they're worth a tremendous amount too and people love the portraits of their boats. So here is the general layout of where this one goes. There's another one over here. This is moored up over here and they have boats are very difficult to draw and paint and what you try to do is to interpret them as best you can in as quick a way as you possibly can. And I believe that I see maybe another one. Yeah, some, some, some sort of a one is sort of facing me here uh, and its prow is facing me. I'm not, can't, can't quite make sure. Maybe we did some close-ups and I'll be able to be able to decipher this one. But then there's another boat over here someplace and then there's a pilot of course because it's a marine picture and the piling is somewhat a little bit underneath the tree this is the placement of it and it's in the distance and then in the foreground way over to the left is a an audacious a prow of a, of a pleasure boat uh, sticking right out into the canal. It's moored here. It has a lovely line that, um, that sort of, uh, it's, it's a, a friendship sloop, I believe, has got this kind of a, of a line to it. And then it has a nice sort of a mirror image in the water. And as you can see, we do not need that grass in the foreground. Something takes place up here on the deck. There is, um, there is a thickness to this deck. And uh, if I can really make out the, uh, the general anatomy of this boat, um, uh, well, I'll be in luck. The um, uh, boats uh, have a strange perspective. They've got a strange shape to them, and they need to be very carefully observed and very carefully looked at. However, this one's got some sort of a fishing arrangement on the top of it, uh, a superstructure, which we'll go in later, but this is the general placement of it. And um, w whatever it's doing up there, it's a nautical thing, which I don't understand, and, and probably um, it's a su sunshade, obviously. You go out and sit for hours on a boat, you're going to need to be protected from the sun. So this is a sort of a structure up there. Well, there's a composition for you. We have a nice line leading uh, right off the picture to that piling, and it's going to go right up to that piling there, and this line that is mooring the boat is going to have another suite there. So there are the diagonals that everybody hopes to find in pictures of any kind, because it does a, it does, the device is that it leads the eye into the picture. There we have a general layout. 
this is the diagonal I'm talking about. And the reflection of this piling can probably be the thing that is going to cause the interest on this side and also the dark, uh, the dark ref uh, reflection in the water of this large group of trees over here. The darkness in the water over here would cause some interest. Well, here we have a general layout of a rather uh, charming scene and it's uh, the opposite of looking out at the water. What you are, are you're in the water or on the water looking toward the land, which can only happen if you're in a place where there are canals. So once again, going to start as I do uh, with the background, namely a cloudless summer Long Island sky, which I'm going to uh, start with a palette knife and lay it out. This is part one, of course, of a, uh, of a two uh, two half hour uh, piece um, so that uh, so some information can be uh, disseminated and uh, be useful and also so that a, a fairly decent and accurate portrait of whatever it is that it, we undertake. I think that, that I as a realist painter I'm very concerned with the idea of having things accurate uh, as well as artistic. It has to have artistic merit but it also has to be accurate. And if, it's, and if, and if it isn't accurate, and if it doesn't, then, then you risk losing the whole flavor of the, uh, of the scene that you are attempting to do. As you can see, my, uh, my palette knife is covering a large area very quickly. And I will may or may not smooth it out later, but this is, uh, I'm painting around these houses. I'm not going to go all the way down because I bothered to lay this out carefully. But I'm, I don't want to make sure not to lose it, but I can go over the trees somewhat. Um, this is just cerulean blue and white, uh, pure out of the tube, nothing complicated. There's no atmosphere problems here, no uh, subtleties that have to be done. This is a clear, uh, uh, cloudless summer sky on Long Island, uh, which if anybody knows, um, knows the island, knows that when those days happen, uh, they are uh, unique unto themselves. Uh, the cloudless days in Greece, I'm sure, are just as beautiful, or Italy, or China. But Long Island has got an atmosphere very, very partial to a painter. It, uh, some, some wonderful things happen on the horizon here on Long Island. Some wonderful things happen with the atmosphere that is here on this, uh, on this island, which has got water on both sides of it. Of course, an island does. But it's a particular body of water. The body of water of Long Island Sound causes lighting and different kinds of atmospheric uh, textures and media that you don't find anywhere else. And then the Atlantic, of course, blows in with its um, with its uh, salty and uh, rambunctious uh, uh, wind patterns, and that causes another uh, very unique and very identifiable uh, st uh, conditions of atmosphere. And uh, many of my paintings that I'm now doing in Virginia that have uh, the atmosphere of Virginia are vastly different. And so it's always uh, interesting to me, and I hope to you, that when you see paintings of Europe, uh, of another century, that the atmosphere was different then. And so landscape painting has a, uh, a valid and very valuable kind of uh, place in, uh, in the art world. It does a number of things. It, um, it freezes in time a place. And it also, if you're a painter, it teaches you about atmosphere and color and so on. Well, I've got this all uh, laid out as the background for this particular study. I'm going to do a very interpretive uh, rendering of this tree. It is in the distance. It does not have to be an actual uh, botanical rendering. We don't particularly care what kind of a tree that is. It's probably a maple of some sort. But at this point, it, is not, uh, it isn't distinct enough to make any difference that I should pay attention to its anatomy or so that I can identify it as a as a maple. It, it is just a green thing over there in the distance uh, that happens to hug this house. And it has uh, variations of green, darks, and lights. And it is also becoming the background for this uh, boat in the foreground. There are some touches of light color on the top. The sun is, the sun is catching some of the light parts of this tree. And those things can be 
uh, interpreted very loosely because as I say we are not doing a botanical rendering of this tree we are doing a background uh, it also goes a little bit further with somewhat darker this is sap green I'm using sap green this is the darker tone mixed with a little bit of white and a touch possibly of some purple to, to lower the value of the green greens to me are extremely offensive when they're improperly used because they're just about everywhere now there's more dark green behind this house that is um, enabling me to show the roof line off it's a pale roof and with the, the, the with this accommodating tree, accommodating tree in the background the pale roof will be far more visible because it's got a dark it's got dark color behind it so all of these all of these things are uh, are the comparative uh, things that take place in my mind when I'm doing a painting and possibly if um, whoever is out there and wants to start painting can start thinking in that way they will find not only is it effective but it also simplifies it I've gone through all the problems of learning how to do this now all you have to do is to be in on that well I'm going to take a short break for a while uh, and um, uh, be right back back again with our lovely canal scene from Bayshore and um, I've just noticed as I was looking as I was uh, during the break I was just noticing here that one can see trunks and a little this nice little uh, sort of a glade of trees underneath here with the little trunks showing in, in silhouette against uh, uh, so there is a lovely grove of trees underneath there and of course casting their shadows underneath so all of this all of this illusion back here uh, will tell you that um, uh, observing this kind of thing it makes it uh, th this is far more interesting than having the trees go all the way down to the uh, to the um, grass line so I think that when you can observe that it's um, it helps the composition a great deal that these little this little break in the trees here is is really rather fun and so maybe sort of even cute um, I'm going to put the uh, the roof uh, color which of this uh, house reminds me very much of Bermuda. I've painted in Bermuda a number of times, and those pale pink tiles in Bermuda are absolutely wonderful. And uh, it's possible, and I'm making this up now, I'm not, it's not really so, but I will bet you if the people who built this house had been to Bermuda, they probably said we want a pink roof like we had in Bermuda or we saw in Bermuda, because uh, it's one of the identifying things. And you don't see pink roofs here very often. It's a particular kind of tile, I think, uh, that uh, turns very pale in the sun. And it's, uh, it's really very luxurious. And you've got to admit that there's nothing really wrong with that look. That's, uh, that's pretty neat stuff. It casts a shadow underneath making it uh, there's a very dark shadow under there it's not black it's a sort of a sienna and it's got some it's got some gray in it and a little bit of green incredibly enough and underneath here there's a very deep shadow too because this is a cloudless day with brilliant sun and underneath here it's also very very dark and the rest of the house even though it's a white house is thrown into deep shadow because of the quality of the um, of the sunlight and the uh, the brighter the sun the deeper for the shadows, uh, which to me is of course always very interesting and uh, vital for the accuracy of a painting.
lady. Here is a d deep gray, which is what it looks that house looks like to me with the with the darkness of the um, of the summer shadows. Uh, yes, this goes underneath here, and there's that strange white tower. I don't know what it is, but it's 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 there. And I'm going to do the shadow is quite is quite low, it, uh, sh throwing the shadow way down on the white part of this house. And here's the same deep shadow underneath there. You know it's a white house somehow, even though the shadows are very dark gray. The windows can be put in very interpretively, uh, just to indicate how many are there, one, two, three, or something. And up here, I can barely even see a window. So um, uh, that's uh, about all that you would need to do, except for some pure white. And I'm, I don't have a brush that's really clean. Yes, I do. A brush that's clean enough to, to go into the into the tube of white and just put a great wonderful luscious blob of white for that white structure whatever that is it's, it looks like it's a very modern addition to this house it's uh, some sort of a baffle it's some sort of a wall maybe it's just an architectural um, uh, motif uh, but it is nevertheless uh, distinctive of this house and here's the rest of the house underneath in pure white and then the bushes are going to go in front of that so this little tiny uh, this little tiny um, area of this painting has to have observance and enough accuracy to it to be able to be recognizable. I believe that this has got to be a little bit paler up here. Um, uh, in front of that house, there are bushes. All you do, uh, you indicate them uh, slightly. And uh, it's, it, it, to me, it's always extremely fun to see something take place uh, uh, rather rapidly as you um, as you progress and go from one 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 place on the canvas to another, uh, you will find yourself uh, being intrigued with the idea that you can cover that much space in a short period of time. The lawn, of course, is um, is a uh, obviously a chemical and very carefully manicured lawn. It's brilliant green in the sunlight and uh, goes clear on down to the water. This is what uh, I suppose um, uh, the the great dream of owning a house by the water is to have the lawn go clear down to the water. And here we have the realization of the American dream. Um, it takes some time and it takes uh, work and I'm sure that it takes a, a lot of maneuvering to, to own this kind of thing. But uh, there it is and uh, there is an awful lot of them across this country and especially across this island because where there's water, there is wealth. That's something that I have said for a long time. <laughs> um, there is a dead tree right here in the middle and I'm sure that they're absolutely having a fit over that dead tree and can't wait for somebody to come and take it down. I'm not going to put it in, but then again I may be perverse enough to decide to put the dead tree in. I'll wait a while and see whether or not it'll help the, com the composition, but um, uh, I'm sure that uh, the, kind of, um, the kind of owners of these places will uh, remove uh, the dead tree. It looks to me like it's probably a poplar that couldn't stand the buffeting winds nor the um, salt air. Uh, poplars are not happy with that. So. Um, here I'm going to progress on to the uh, perfectly white house, bathed in sunshine, brilliant white, coming right out of the tube, but it must be painted. You can't leave the canvas. And uh, it, um, where are the shadows? Anyway, I'll do the, I'll do the gray uh, of the roof, and you will see that the progression of this is uh, simply takes place as you, as you, as you work it. Uh, there is not jumping from one to the other. You've got to get the background done before you do the, um, before you do the, uh, any of the uh, boat or the water in front of it. The background has to get done. So the gray of this roof is, um, is going to be another identifying thing. So as I say, the people who commissioned me to do paintings of their houses are very particular about whether or not it's going to look exactly the way it is and that's what you strive for. So uh, the anatomy of a house is as equally as important as that of a mountain range or a face. Uh, if you're a realist you uh, make sure that what you're interpreting and what you're showing is, uh, is recognizable. Uh, there is uh, something called imp impressionism and that's lovely too, and I've tried Impressionism, but I'm much more drawn to a realism. And uh, that's, why I am, that's why I have this program, which talks about realis realistic painting. And this is it. So here's, the, here's this gray house with the very, very white walls and the dark, uh, the dark windows. Uh, here, there are three of them.
one, two, three. That is essential, that those windows be exactly the way, the way they are seen there. If they're not, it's not the house. Um, so oh, as, long as, I'm, as long as I'm coming towards the end of this, of this session, uh, let me tell you that there is a great deal going for the business of sitting out on a summer day and uh, painting what you see. A lot of people find it extremely difficult, but I think that if you overcome it the first time, you'll find yourselves really intrigued with the idea of working from life. For goodness sakes, try it before you go out and buy a set of paints uh, with other artists' name on them and some kind of a formula for doing some imaginary place in some imaginary planet at some imaginary time of year. Go out and paint what is around you. It will be a lesson well learned and something which just may open up a door that you ever, never even knew was there as far as painting and observation is concerned. I can almost guarantee that you will uh, be forever changed with that experience, uh, more than likely for the better, and certainly creatively, you will have stepped into an area which may have been unknown to you before. So, with this uh, particular beginning, and as you can see, I'm, I'm interpreting this tree, not willing to admit that I don't know what it is. It's not important what it is. What is important is that I observe that it casts a heavy shadow underneath, and that it's growing on the other side of this canal, and is whole part of the general color scheme and composition of this picture. It gets very dark down, down underneath this tree, obviously, because it's a, it's a huge tree. It's whenever there's a great deal of darkness underneath a tree, it means it's a great big one and that it has a lot of uh, very deep spaces in it. Um, that's another thing about painting trees. Uh, for goodness sakes, don't think that you can paint a tree out of your imagination. It has uh, uh, f facets to it which are observable only at certain times of the day. That tree at that time of day looks only like that at that time of day. So um, the business of taking a brush full of color and whacking the canvas with it and saying, there, that sort of looks like a tree. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't. It just never does look like a tree. Forget it. <clears throat> um, if I put the white of this building in here, and I've got to get a clean brush to do that, and I seem to be running out. No, here's a nice one. Yeah, I think that'll do it. Um, uh, remember, whenever you go into a pale color, if you don't have a very clean brush, you're going to experience the frustration of all time, and that is to pick up uh, the other color that's on the brush, and it going to screws up the entire color scheme of the whole thing. It happened here. It, my, my brush was a little bit dirty, and it kind of got green, so I got to go over that and make that pure white, because that house is actually white as it can be, as white as chalk in the sunlight. So here is the here is the putting in of the color of this house, and then the bushes are going to go in front of it uh, as we wind up, and as I continue to uh, lecture you about being observant. Uh, it's great fun to be observant. It's um, we have television which tells us everything. We don't have to work at anything uh, with the television, and we have therefore become, I think, a little bit lax in our observational powers. And um, the human brain is such an extraordinary a machine that it can observe something and deduce and understand and remember. So uh, painting helps one do all that, uh, um, probably better than anything else in the arts. Painting is going to teach how to observe and remember and then understand at the same time. Uh, so here we have, now let's, see, let, let's see, we're going to count windows now. And we're gonna, as, as I wind up, I'm counting windows. There's a picture window here, I believe. And so, as the, uh, as the time, unfortunately, as usual, comes to an end, let me, uh, let me ask you to try to uh, tune in for the second part of this one. This is part one of a canal in Bayshore. That's uh, just about simple as it is. The second part will come forward and involve the front of the foreground and the boat and the water. I hope you got something out of it. Try it yourself sometime. Bye-bye. See you next time.